send your son to condemn the world so that the world might be saved through him. And we gather together of those <coughs> who have been saved by your grace and through faith. And we pray there's one here this morning who's not come to that point in their life where they've been saved by grace. We pray that you 
pray that this morning is the day of their new birth, that they'll be born again into your image. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Please be seated. It's a couple. I don't know if there's really not going on. Any. We've, we kept this month quiet for, for a reason, to come before the, the storm is coming. But, um, just a, a reminder of our Sunday school. we got Sunday school for, for everyone from, from birth all the way up um, through adults, the little ones, the, the youth, and our adults. So take advantage of those things as a, another time of learning, another time of discipleship, uh, another term of time of, of fellowship. And our invite ready to come. And of course, we're going through Exodus on Wednesday nights. Uh, this past Wednesday, we went through Exodus uh, chapter 12, which is a pivotal chapter, not only in Exodus, but throughout all scripture. It's the institution of the Passover, followed by the actual Exodus out of Egypt. And both of those things are a foreshadowing of Christ, because Christ is our Passover lamb. He was crucified during Passover, and he's the one that gives us the true Exodus, the Exodus out of sin and death. So if you weren't here, invite her to go uh, find Find that uh, that study either on our uh, Facebook page or on the website. It's again a pivotal uh, chapter throughout all Scripture. I think that's everything we got. So our oh, sorry, go ahead, Renee. Um, this is that we're getting ready to start our new Bible study. So if anybody wants to join it, I can get an email so I can get the order so I can have people that need to start. Okay, so everybody's going to join in that. Uh, Women's Bible study, get with Renee, that way she can get all the materials. The reading, our scripture reading from this morning is going to come from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason of the world. The reason, and that is what we we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has the hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure.
Psalms, Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause 
against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them leave me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with a lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise again, again, praise him, my salvation and my God. And we ask the ushers to come. Roger, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. Lord, we just ask for clarity in, in your message, Lord, to open our ears to understand, to hear, Lord, that you've given us, Lord. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 16, verses 9 through 18 this morning. I just got eight short pages of notes for you. In my short 45-minute sermons, I only have five-page notes. But in God's sovereignty this morning, he gave everyone an extra hour of sleep today <laughs> for this very message that's being brought to you this morning. So in the parable of the dishonest manager, Jesus is pointing out the urgency to make a decision about our future right now. We can't wait until later because we don't know if we're going to be here later. That was the point of the parable of the rich fool who decided he was going to eat, drink, and be married. But he was a fool because his soul was required of him that very day. His plans were for the future. They were worldly plans with no thought of eternity. We must decide right now if we're going to follow Christ or follow the world. There is no in-between. There's no option three. We are either with him or we're against him. When the Israelites were ready to enter the promised land, Joshua exhorted them to make a decision right then. They had to leave the gods of Egypt behind. They had to leave idolatry behind. They needed to leave sin behind. You need to choose, Joshua says in Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your fathers who were served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve. That's what Jesus was saying. You must choose. Joshua says, if you think it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then go serve the world and all that it has to offer in its sin. The choice is yours. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Tomorrow, is never promised to us, but eternity is. 
Whatever decision you make, eternity is promised for you. And that's repeated over and over again all throughout Scripture. In John chapter 5, verses 25 to 29, Jesus is exhorting his disciples. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is here now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. Jesus says the time is coming. And in fact, that time has already come. It's here right now. When you're going to hear the gospel, and those who choose to hear it are going to live. For as the Father has life in himself, so also he granted the Son also to have life in himself. Jesus says, I have the power and authority to grant you life. He's given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. <coughs> Don't marvel at this, Jesus says. Don't be perplexed by this saying. And then he says it again, for an hour is coming. Now he's speaking of a future hour when all those who are in the tombs, all those who are physically dead, will hear his voice as well and they will be raised in a resurrection to those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Those who have done good, that's not talking about your good works and your good deeds. No, those who have done good, goes back to verse 24, or excuse me, verse 25. Those who hear the voice of the Son of God and listen, they will live. They've heard the gospel, they've believed it, they've repented and come to Christ. Those who have done good are raised to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil, those who have heard the gospel and who have rejected it. They've rejected God, they've rejected his son, they've rejected his gospel. They too will be raised to the resurrection of judgment. There is an urgency to the gospel message. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, Peter says, The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise that some count slowness. Even in Peter's day, there was detractors of the gospel saying, You keep saying that the Lord is coming. I'm looking around. I don't see him. Today, much is still said the same way. You keep saying that the Lord's coming. I'm looking. I don't see him coming. Peter says, Don't count his slowness. the inability in order to fulfill his promise. Peter says you should be glad that the Lord hasn't come because you're still dead and you're trespassing in sin. The only reason that he hasn't come is because he's patient with you. He's not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But make no mistake about it. The day of the Lord is going to come. He's going to come like a thief. That was the favorite reference to the eschaton when Christ returned. Because a thief comes when you least expect it. When Christ comes, it's going to be a moment that you're not ready. You're going to least expect it. It's going to happen in the blink of an eye. And then that's it. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. The heavenly bodies are going to be burned up and dissolved. Earth and all the works are going to be done. And everything will be exposed. Therefore, repent and believe the gospel now. That was the message in the parable of the dishonest man. Now Luke 16, verses 9 through 18. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they might receive you into eternal dwelling. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who is going to entrust you with true riches? If you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what's exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. 
Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Back in 9 through 13, in this first section here, Jesus is continuing his thought on the parable of the dishonest manager. In that parable, he's speaking to his disciples, to those who are following him. And now his comments seem to be now directed back to the Pharisees who are still standing nearby listening. This dishonest manager, he made friends with unrighteous wealth so that when things didn't work out, he'd have some place to go. And still using the basis of that parable, Jesus now uses that as a springboard in his criticism that he has against the Pharisees. This is what I have against you. It's a lesson on faithfulness. Faithfulness and dishonesty cannot go with one another. The ends never justify the means. <coughs> the dishonest manager was not faithful. He was dishonest. And obviously Jesus now is talking about the Pharisees. We see down in verse 14 because they respond to it. The lesson here is simple. It can be applied in almost every walk of life. If a person can be faithful with little, they can be trusted to be faithful with much. The opposite is also true. One who is dishonest with little is probably going to be dishonest with much. You can't take someone who's been dishonest with little and then say, well, maybe if we give him more responsibility, then he'll finally be faithful. It's very similar to what we were talking about on Wednesday night. When we get all, all these little details that they had to follow for the Passover, and we're talking about Leviticus. If you read Leviticus, there's all these little minute details that they had to follow by the letter of the law. It goes to show that if a person is not willing to obey God in all these small things, then they're not going to obey God when it comes to big things. It only goes to show that they had no interest in a covenant relationship with them at all. If you can't be trusted with little things, you can't be trusted with much. Jesus now takes that lesson and applies it to the kingdom of God. This term unrighteous wealth, it can mean worldly wealth. And that's probably the way we should understand it because that's the contrast that we see here. It's a contrast between worldly wealth, worldly riches, and heavenly wealth, eternal riches. If one is unfaithful with worldly wealth, which will have zero consequence on your eternal matters, it doesn't matter, you're not going to take any of your money, all of your mansions, or your cars, or properties, nothing is going with you into the next life. So if you're unfaithful with all the wealth and riches you have here, which has no consequence on eternity, then why would that person be entrusted with heavenly wealth? If you can't be a faithful steward with someone else's wealth, then why would anyone give you your own wealth to manage? The Pharisees have been given a great responsibility. They were the keepers of the law. They're the stewards of the temple. They were the overseers of God's house, and they have completely mismanaged that responsibility. But in their minds, they believed that because of their position, because of their position on earth, they're also going to have that position and responsibility in heaven. Because God may be wealthy, he's made me a priest on earth, therefore when I go into heaven, I'm going to be a a powerful and priestly man there as well. Their position translated from here to there. I am a earthly priest, therefore when I go into heaven, I'm going to be an honored and powerful and blessed heavenly priest. And Jesus uses this lesson to point out how ridiculous that belief was. Saying if with the little responsibility that you had here that you have completely mismanaged, what makes you think somehow you would be given heavenly things to manage? If you have completely mismanaged all your worldly wealth, why would God give you his wealth to manage? 
And when it's pointed out like that, we can see how ridiculous that claim was. But that's how they believed it. Because their position in life here, they thought that was going to be their position in life there. Jesus gives a similar teaching back in chapter 12, verses 35 to 48. Twelve thirty-five. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door with him at once when he comes in and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service, have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. But if he comes to the second or third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this: that if the master of the house had Known what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling us this parable, or is it for all? The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant, whom his master will find so doing when he comes, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to his, himself, my master is delayed in coming, he begins to beat the male and female servants to eat, drink, and to get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he does not expect, and cut him to pieces and put him on the unfaithful. Again, this is a, all ties in to what Jesus is saying in chapter 16. He's saying the exact same thing. He's just using different words. This is all directed to the Pharisees. The master is coming and they're not being found faithful in what they're doing. Jesus is going to tell he's telling them that if they don't repent and change their ways, they're going to find themselves with the unfaithful. <clears throat> that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. Jesus has already warned them. And again, he's warning them again. That's grace. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. We deserve condemnation, but he brought salvation instead. Verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he be devoted to one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and money. So Jesus is now finally making his point. This is the core of everything that was just said and everything that's going to be said. You cannot serve two masters. You can't be a slave to two different people. It doesn't work. We have the contrast between these two words, four words, love, hate, devoted, despised. You cannot love both masters. You cannot be, be devoted to two masters. It's impossible because one wants you to do one thing. The other wants you to do something else. So by doing the one, you're showing the other that you actually hate and despise them. And Jesus gives what two masters he's speaking of. God and money. God and mammon. The Aramaic word it means money, wealth, possessions, property, prestige, power, position. You cannot love and be devoted to both of those things simultaneously. And this isn't a condemnation on wealth. There are many people who are wealthy in Scripture that God has blessed. It's a condemnation on greed, the love of money and wealth. Paul took this teaching and then expanded on it in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many pains. Money's not the root of all evil. The love of money. Jesus is saying is that the accumulation of wealth can be detrimental 
because you end up becoming a servant to it. You become a slave to money. It controls you. It'll control your thoughts, your wants, your needs, your desires. Just as Paul says, that desire to be rich will cause many people to fall into temptation. You'll start doing things that you normally wouldn't do. It'll trap you into snares, harmful desires. It'll plunge you into ruin and destruction to the point where some people have completely wandered from the faith because of that love and need for money. Money's a funny thing. It will make you do funny things. And the more you have, the more possessions you have, the more those possessions possess you. Of course, we all say to ourselves, that's not me. That could never be me. Jesus said you can't love God and money, but I'm the exception to the rule. I've found a way where I can do both. I bet all of us, including yours truly, at some point in our lives have made an immoral or an unethical decision based on money. Either so that we could gain more of it, or so we wouldn't lose more of it. If you've ever accidentally put the wrong number on your tax return before you sent it in, we've compromised our integrity and our, sanct our sanctification, and most of the time it's over a few dollars, because that's the power that money has on us. But not me, I've, I'm just saying that in general. I'm nobody here, I'm sure, has ever done those things. I've never do those. That would never happen to me. Well, if you believe that, then you're in good company, or rather bad company, because that's what the Pharisees believed. They believed that they were the exception <coughs> to the rule. Verses 14 and 15, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The Pharisees ridiculed Jesus. They scoffed at him. Before we get down to the scoffing, Luke gives us some information first. He doesn't hold us in suspense. He tells us right away why they were scoffing. They were lovers of money. Jesus just said, you cannot love both God and money. And then Luke immediately follows that up and says, the Pharisees were lovers of money. So by contrast, what Luke is then implying is that they are not lovers of God. Because you cannot love both. Jesus just said that. You will love and be devoted to one, and you will hate and despise the other. That's what Jesus just said to the faces of these Pharisees. He wasn't trying to make friends. He was saying what needed to be said in hopes that it was going to save someone's eternal soul. And sometimes the best way to say it is to say it with no sugar on top. The Pharisees heard what Jesus said and they ridiculed him. They scoffed at him for such a statement. Why? Why would they scold Jesus? Because they thought that they were living proof that you could do both. What do you mean you can't love both God and money? Just look at us. Look at me. I love money. I also love God too. <coughs> because of their positions as Pharisees and priests and scribes, they believed that they were above reproach for all their unscrupulous behavior. How I've gained my power and wealth is of no consequence because I'm a Pharisee and steward of a temple. That was just business. So I've, if I've gained money and wealth because of my position, then all that money is clean as far as they're concerned because it was during my position as a priest. Therefore, that makes me a man of God. Jesus says that you've got it completely backwards. 
It's how you've gained your wealth and how you've used it, which demonstrates that you are not men of God. And you like to justify yourselves before other people with all your reasons and all of your excuses on how you've done it. But God knows your heart. Do ever stop and ever contemplate that? God knows every single thing that you've ever thought of in your heart and in your mind. And yet he still loves you. God knows your heart. We can fool one another, but you can't fool him. He knows exactly what's going on on the inside. What you flaunt before men is an abomination before God. All their justification of how and why they do the things that they do. Over in Matthew 23, in his seven woes to the Pharisees, Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. On the outside you look all clean and holy and righteous, but on the inside you're dead and your trespasses and sins, nothing but hypocrites and sinners. God knows your heart, which leads us into verses 16 through 18. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. They claim to be lovers of God, men of righteousness. So Jesus uses the scripture in order to prove them wrong. If you want to show someone where they're going wrong in their life, don't show them in your opinion. Show them in scripture where they're going off track. The law and the prophets, that's just a way of saying the Old Testament. That's how the Old Testament was referred to. The whole Old Testament was proclaimed until John. It all pointed to Jesus. It all pointed to Christ. And John, he's speaking of John the Baptist, John was like the hinge in history. He was the last of what we would think of the Old Testament prophets. He was the hinge into the New Covenant. He's the one who came to prepare the way for the Lord. The whole Old Testament was proclaimed until John, and then from John on, we have the Gospel. To repent of our sins and be saved. That's what John preached. He preached a message of salvation, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. If you were of God, then you would have responded to the gospel that's being preached to you. The kingdom of God is at hand. And not only have you not responded to my gospel, but you haven't even kept the law of God whom you say you love. You say you love God, then why have you broken his commandments? The gospel has been preached. The gates of the kingdom of heaven have swung open and people are pressing in, trying to force their way into it. But the Pharisees are supposed to be the leaders of righteousness, are standing outside those gates and resisting and not only resisting, but they're preventing others from entering. They've missed what's truly valuable. More valuable than their worldly wealth that they cling to. In Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46, Jesus tells us the most valuable thing that we could ever possess. And it's not money. Matthew 13, 44 the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up and then he, with his joy, he goes and sells everything that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls 
who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Those who are lovers of money would never give up all that they had to buy that field or that pearl. Their money and their wealth, their possessions are more precious to them. And then Jesus hammers the point home by pointing out how they deal with God's law. <coughs> this God who you claim to love, then why do you treat his word and his law with such contempt? All heaven and earth will pass away before one dot of the law becomes void. One day, everything in this earth will pass away. We'll all be burned up, just as we read in 1 Peter 3. Heaven and earth, everything will be burned up, except for one thing. One thing will remain, and that's God's word. Because it's the only thing in this earth and on this earth that is true and right and holy. Everything else will be burned up. In judgment, God's word will endure forever. The institution of marriage is sacred. What God has joined together, let no man separate. But in total and complete disregard for God's word, they'd rather have the applause of men. They would do whatever they could to justify themselves before men. So they would, grant, they would grant divorces left and right with no regard to God or his word, but they love God. That's still their claim. Their justification was Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1 because Moses granted certificates of divorce which many people pointed out to Jesus and he says the only reason that it was granted is because of our hardness of hearts, because of our sinful nature. Deuteronomy 24, 1, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if, the, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some indecency in her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house and she separates out of his house. So this clause found some indecency in her, quote, unquote, that's a matter of interpretation. And if there's a loophole to be found in God's commands, rest assured, we will search and try to find it. There were two schools of thought in Jesus' day, two leading rabbis, Shammai and Hillel. And if you wanted a divorce, you had to go to the priests in order to get one granted. You had to go argue your case before them. Shammai interpreted Deuteronomy 24, very conservatively, only in matters of sexual immorality would a certificate of divorce be granted, which is the obvious interpretation of Deuteronomy 24 when you just read it on its surface. However, Hillel interpreted very broadly and liberally. In his writings, he even states that this indecency that a husband can find in his wife could be as her burning his food. So if she burnt your toast this morning, that was justification to get a certificate of divorce. If the husband lost interest in his wife and he found someone more attractive in his eyes, then that was enough to have indecency in her. So if you wanted a divorce, who would you go to? You'd go to the one who granted and sign off on it no matter what. These were the men who loved God. The keepers of the law. And this is how they treated the word of God. With absolute contempt. <clears throat> because it's not as simple as just saying, here's your divorce, you go this way, you go that way, to live your happy lives separated from one another. No, there were serious consequences to divorce. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. He who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. You've misled someone into breaking God's commandments. 
Now there are biblical grounds for divorce because of the hardness of our hearts. We won't turn to each one, but I'll tell you where they're at in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, Matthew chapter 19, verses 9. And in cases of sexual immorality, this is Jesus' teaching on divorce, i.e., is what Deuteronomy is stating. If Jesus interpreted Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, as sexual immorality, you would probably be good to interpret it that way as well. Paul gives us another one in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. And not Paul. If you go up a few verses earlier, I think verse 10, Paul says, I'm going to tell you about marriage and divorce. And then he said, he stops himself and he says, not I, but the Lord. He says, this comes directly from the Lord. And it's an abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. So if your spouse has committed sexual immorality, you have grounds for divorce. If your unbelieving spouse abandons you and leaves you, Paul says, you're under no obligation to chase them down. You can therefore be biblically divorced and biblically remarried with no consequence of sin. Those are the only two mentioned in Scripture. All other divorces lead to adultery. Jesus is telling the Pharisees, your contempt of God's word has led hundreds of people walking around as adulterers, and they all think they're fine. Why? Because the priests said so. People walking around in their sin because they had contempt for God's word and all those people thought that they were just fine in God's eyes. To put it more harshly, Jesus is saying, you're responsible for this nation of God in becoming a nation of whores. That's what you've done to God's people. That's the directness that Jesus is using in his words against the Pharisees because that's how they have treated God's word. This is what they've done to God's people. They have led them to commit immorality. People are trying to hear and respond to the gospel. They're trying to force their way in and you stand there resisting and preventing. This is a word of warning to many people today who mistreat God's word in such a way. There are many churches, I use that term very loosely, churches who will stand behind, someone is standing behind a pulpit somewhere here in this country and telling all the people who are sitting out there that they're speaking to, living in sexual immorality, that they're completely fine in God's eyes. And they're going to leave church this morning and they're going to go home dead in their trespasses and sins yet believing that they have been saved by grace through faith. This is what the Pharisees were doing to these people, the same way that many pastors and preaching or preachers are doing the exact same thing this morning in many churches across the world. Everything that you're doing is just fine. Go live your life. Because they receive the applause of men rather than take God's word serious. What Jesus is telling them is the same thing he's telling everyone. You better repent and believe the gospel before it's too late. Because one day you're going to have to give an account for your life. That was the message that he gave in the parable of the dishonest manager. And then he pointed out exactly the sins that the Pharisees were committing. Everything that you've said and done, you'll have to give an account for. Because God knows your heart. That heart has to be renewed. It must be transformed. You have to be born again. You can't be a lover of God and then do exactly the opposite of what God's word says. Which is the message that's going to be preached to a lot of people this morning. They're going to be Told exactly what they're doing is fine. God destroyed entire civilizations over sexual immorality. 
don't think that he won't do the same thing with this one. This isn't a message to unbelievers. This is the message to those who think they already believe. The Pharisees thought that they were, they're not only believers, they were the leader of the believers in their own hearts and minds. You better think twice about your what you do in the body. You can't be a lover of God and do the opposite of what his word says. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient for you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and all the works that are done in it will be exposed. Spurgeon said, if you're going to be a Christian, then be a marked and distinct one. What a good word. Don't be a Christian and then blend in with the world. If you're going to be a Christian, be one that's marked and distinct from the people that you stand with and the world that you stand in. The urgency all throughout chapter 16 really 15 and 16. 15 was the lost. Rejoice when those who repent are found. The six, verse chapter 16 is the urgency to repent and believe before it's too late. And we're going to see that play out next week in Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Because after it's too late, there is no such thing as making it unto late again. Once that time comes and judgment's made, you're on one side of the golf or on the other side, and those who are on this side don't go to the other side. Those on the other side don't come to this side. The decision is swift. The decision is final. Therefore, repent and believe the gospel now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, that when you sent him, you did not send him to condemn us but that we might be saved through him. And now there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've been sanctified, we've been made holy, we've been justified and been made righteous, and on the day of your return we'll be glorified. And as the scripture we read this morning in 1 John 3, we will see you for who you truly are. The way that we love you now and we aren't, we aren't even close in our understanding of who you are. On that day when we are able to see with our glorified eyes for who you truly are and what you truly done for us. And we'll spend an eternity celebrating that in worship. We know some of your words are harsh and they're meant to be. Sugar-coated gospels usually go in one ear and out the other. But it's the harshness that convicts our hearts. It should point out the sin that we have in our life that we might repent of it. We pray that we have the <coughs> strength to say what needs to be said, even though we need to use love and tact behind what, what we say. But at the same time, sometimes it just needs to be blunt. We pray that hearts and minds are open to hear your word, to hear your voice, and to hear your call on each one of their lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you read the Gospels, now that this comes to mind, I'd be almost curious to know. A good study. Somebody doesn't have any time this week, you need to have some homework. How many times does Jesus use sugar when he calls people to repentance? I'm going to guess zero. No, he used directness. We don't have enough time to use sugar. We don't have days or weeks or months or years. We don't know if we've got tomorrow. And the people that he was speaking to, like the rich fool thought he had years to go, God says, You're a fool. Your life is going to, your soul is counted for you today. Jesus spoke with directness. 
directness is usually what convicts us because if if we're offended by directness, then there's probably a reason. We're offended because it struck a nerve within our hearts. And if it's God's word that struck the nerve, uh, we can be rest assured that it's not God who's wrong. Because when everything's burnt up, the only thing that's going to remain is his word because his word's eternal. His word is sharp, like a two-edged sword. It cuts all the way down to bone and marrow because that's what it's supposed to. When it cuts us, it lets us know that we're out of line and that we need to come back into line. This is what Jesus was trying to tell the Pharisees. You've been out of line. You need to get back into line with God's word and his commandments. It wasn't too late for them. We know as you go in to read the book of Acts, Luke tells us that many priests came to faith in Christ. We know that Jesus' brother, James, if you read his he was a Pharisee. He was one of the priests. He didn't believe in Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry. It wasn't until after the resurrection that James was there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, as well as everyone else in Jesus' family. And of course, James went on to be one of the leaders of the early church and gave us one of the books in the New Testament. He wasn't condemning them because Jesus didn't come to condemn people to hell. He came to save them. And even in his strictness of words, we read through the rest of Scripture again, read in Acts, that many of these men that he was talking strict to, they heard and received and believed the gospel, because that's the point, to draw people to God, to draw people to Christ through the conviction of sin. If you have any questions about that, sure love to meet with you. I'd like everybody to please stand. We're going to worship through song one more time. We'll see you back on Wednesday night or next Sunday for Sunday school at 930 and worship for dinner.
said, on this time where we can worship you and glorify your name, and yes, it is all about you. All about you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us. Forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. Lord, God, be with us this week that, uh, that it's all about you all week in our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.